screen. And, uh, Thank you, Krishna. Pressure is on, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After yeah. your, <laughs> nice your presentation. Okay, I started sharing. I hope everyone can see the screen and I'll switch to um, presentation okay. mode. It's all good. Working so far? Yep. And I'll turn the laser pointer on as well. Okay, thank you again for the introduction, Krishna. It's my pleasure to provide this presentation today on geosynthetic clay liners, in particular related to the variably saturated behavior of these materials. My main research collaborator in this investigation is Dr. Jim Hansen from Cal Poly. Additional collaborators included Dr. Craig Benson and Dr. Tarek Abichu. The main graduate student in this study was Jake Riskin. We had an NSF REU student, an undergraduate student, Barry Darius. Students from University of Wisconsin helped out with the investigation, Jianan Chen, Hulia Salihola, and Wei Jun Yang. And the project was partially supported by different grants from the National Science Foundation, the Global Waste Research Institute, as well as the Department of Energy. And samples were provided by SETCO, one of the larger geosynthetic line liner manufacturers in the US. I will start with some background information on GCLs, geosynthetic clay liners. These are materials that are used as barriers against transmission of fluids. This is both for liquids as well as gases. They are, because of this barrier function, extensively used in containment applications. They're thin prefabricated products, composite materials, consisting of layered soil and geosynthetic systems. The common soil that's used in the GCLs are montmorillonite-based clay minerals. These are processed and referred to as bentonite. The trade name, which has become essentially synonymous with the name, um, the mineral designation montmorillonite in GCL um, definitions. The bentonite that's used in GCLs is typically a sodium bentonite. The main exchangeable cation in the montmorillonite is sodium. This material is typically present in the granular format. The bentonite is in granules within the GCL, and these are on the order of the size of a coarse sand or a very fine gravel, coolant diameter on the order of a few millimeters. These materials are very common in the US again, and it's used in conventional traditional GCLs. There are also materials, GCLs, that are constructed using, that are produced using modified bentonites. Typically, these are modified with chemicals, including polymers, and those are materials that are intended for more niche applications dealing with very harsh chemicals such as very alkaline, highly alkaline solutions. And in two weeks from now, Dr. Benson will be talking about some applications related to these products. My presentation today will be mainly focused on the more commonly used conventional traditional GCLs. In terms of the geosynthetics, these materials have either geotextiles or less commonly geomembranes and also in some cases, an additional to a film layer may be present in the material. The main types of the materials are unreinforced and reinforced GCLs. Montmorillonite is a very highly plastic, high activity clay mineral. It has a high cation exchange capacity and a low hydraulic conductivity. The graphic in this slide is a schematic representation of hydraulic conductivity versus percentage of exchangeable cations that may be present in the um, exchange complex of a clay mineral. And we have data shown for kaolinite, illite, and montmorillonite, the three common clay minerals. If we look at montmorillonite data, we see that the hydraulic conductivity is the lowest when the material has the highest amount of sodium in the exchange complex. As the amount of sodium in the montmorillonite increases, hydraulic conductivity decreases, and the reverse is applicable for calcium. As the amount of calcium decreases, the hydraulic conductivity also decreases. 
In terms of the hydraulic conductivity for typical geosynthetic clay liner materials, we're looking at numbers on the order of 10 to the minus nine centimeters per second. This axis here, you can think of it as a um, log scale axis and changes in uh, the percentage of exchangeable cations would result in potentially orders of magnitude of change in the hydraulic conductivity of the montmorillonite. When the montmorillonite has high amounts of sodium, it has a material that has very high affinity for water. It has thick double layers around the individual clay minerals. It's swollen, has high void ratio, and overall a very good material against transfer of fluids, especially water in the system. The main GCL types unreinforced and reinforced are shown in this slide. Reinforced materials are more common than unreinforced versions. In terms of the reinforced materials, these are bentonite GCLs that are sandwiched between two layers of geotextiles, either woven or non-woven materials. And the reinforcement is achieved by either stitch bonding or needle punching. Unreinforced material typically has bentonite held in place by an adhesive, and this could be a system where the bentonite and adhesive mixture is in between two geotextiles or the mixture is attached to a single geomembrane. The geofilm containing materials could be either unreinforced or reinforced, and in this case, the thin geofilm or the polymer film is attached to one of the geotextiles in the system and provides added barrier function. Some examples of these materials, the products that are shown in these two photos are exactly the same. The difference is they're flipped over showing the opposite side of the material. The three materials on top are reinforced products. The material on the far left, top of the left photo is a reinforced GCL that has also a thin geofilm. You can see the black geofilm material through the lighter colored geosynthetic or geotextile material in the system. In this case, this is a stitch bonded material. The other two are also reinforced products. And these two are needle punched GCLs, which have both woven and non-woven components in the system. The material at the bottom is a non-reinforced GCL and has the bentonite adhesive mixture showing on this side and the flip side, the other side of the material is a single geomembrane product. These materials are used very commonly in landfill applications, both as bottom liner systems and also as cover systems. They're used in surface impoundments for containing contaminated liquids used in ponds and reservoirs for containment of water, liners for water conveyance canals, multiple uses in mining waste applications, including liners for mining waste piles, as well as liner for tailings containment or heap leach ponds. They're used in agric agricultural containment applications to contain liquids or solids, clean or contaminated materials secondary containment for underground storage tanks, as well as as part of vertical cutoff wall systems. In terms of field deployment, these materials arrive at a site in a roll, and they are placed carefully along whatever the containment area is. In this case, we're looking at a uh, landfill material, landfill application. It's the bottom liner for a landfill, and it's part of a composite liner system where we have a geomembrane shown in the middle over here overlying the GCL. The material is essentially placed in an anchor trench on top of a slope and then laid carefully along the slope and extends to the bottom of the cell, and the construction continues in this manner. The materials come in panels. You can see the length or the width of the panel over here. So to cover large areas, they need to be placed side by side. Typically, these materials are placed along overlaps. 
The overlaps are not joined physically in most cases. Sometimes a double-sided tape or heat bonding may be used. And in some cases, some additional powder bentonite material is placed along this overlap. The width of the overlap is typically on the order of maybe six to 12 inches or so. Couple examples of GCL applications in a landfill environment. Again, these materials could be part of a cover system or a bottom liner system. In the cover application, the material acts as a barrier to infiltration or percolation of water coming from outside, either from the atmosphere, rain or snow water, or as part of runoff into the landfill system. We want to prevent excessive amounts of water getting into the landfill to minimize the amount of leachate, contaminated liquids generated within the landfill system. And also the material acts as a barrier against release or emissions of gases from the landfill system into the surrounding environment. Biogases generated in landfill systems, these materials, the gas may have adverse environmental as well as health impacts and also a number of species are greenhouse gases as well as ozone depleting substances. So we try to minimize those by using the covered systems, emissions of those to the atmosphere. In a bottom liner system, the GCL acts as a barrier against the contaminated leachate that's generated within the landfill and prevents the leachate from leaking into the surrounding environment. In these applications, GCLs are exposed to different conditions. When we're looking at materials that are placed near the ground surface at shallow depth, the materials are under the influence of seasonal variations, including moisture variations, temperature variations, wet dry cycling, as well as freestyle cycling. At locations below the grade, at depth, seasonal variations are not highly significant. However, the material may come in contact, the GCL may come in contact with contaminated liquids that may have complex chemistry, and there is potential for interactions with such liquids. Both at near surface as well as at depth applications, it's possible to have cation exchange reactions, exchange interactions with overlying as well as underlying soils, and also interactions with the contained liquids. All of these interactions may result in permanent changes in the behavior of the GCL, including the shrinkage of the GCL panels, and changes in the engineering behavior of the material, decreases in the swelling capacity of the material, increases in the hydraulic conductivity, changes in adderable limits and such. If we look at the GCL moisture conditions in the field, we see that first of all, these materials arrive in the field at water contents above zero. These are highly active, materials, the clay mineral is very active and it tends to absorb moisture from the atmosphere. The product, the material, the GCL is produced in a dry factory environment, transported under dry conditions. However, simply because being exposed to air some point along the line, the material tends to absorb moisture and again arrives on site at high moisture content. In dry climates, dry areas, the water content would be only a few percent. In most regions, most applications, we expect to see moisture contents on the order of five to 15 percent or so. And in some areas with highly humid climates, we can see moisture contents in excess of uh, 20 percent in the incoming materials. And the field under operational conditions, the material may be acting in saturated or unsaturated conditions. The material, the GCL, might be undergoing hydration or dehydration, wetting or drying at a given time. And the water content of the material is typically a function of climatic conditions, placement configuration, water content of adjacent soils, and the integrity of the exchangeable cations in the um, exchange complex of the Mount Merlinite. Based on the field studies, Geosynthetic clay liner water contents in the range of 2 to 180 percent have been reported. Seasonal variations also have been reported. The variation between 30 to 100 percent between summer and winter is reported for one case 
uh, in a cold, humid climate and shows a large range of variation in the moisture content of the material and the field scale. For most cases, the two to 180 percent range is the overall range. Most field data indicate actually that the moisture content of GCLs in the field is typically less than 100%. Based on laboratory analysis, under submerged conditions, we expect the saturated moisture content of GCLs to be somewhere in the range 140 to 240%. And as you can see again, in the field, the numbers are much lower. The materials are typically under unsaturated conditions. I am an example of GCL exhumation um, activity here. This is something that we did here locally in our area. This was a landfill bottom liner that was constructed and left exposed to the atmosphere. The cell was never filled for about a 12 year period. In this case, this was a composite liner system, a GCL overlain by a geomembrane. And at the end of this 12 year period, the landfill operator realized that this material is no longer intact and good to use for uh, a barrier system. And the liner was exhumed for replacement with a new set of materials. We had an opportunity, we had a chance to observe the exhumation process and also collected samples from the field for determination of different properties of the materials. We collected samples from both the geomembrane and the underlying GCL material. We observed that the moisture content of the underlying material was variable, very dry near the top, somewhat more moist near the bottom. The GCL also was highly variable depending on the location of the samples that we collected. This figure over here is showing, looking up towards the top of the hill. And in this case, we're seeing that this is the GCL material. The material had shrunk, the panels had shrunk, and we can see gaps between the panels and the underlying soil is exposed. The GCL is not really functioning properly as a barrier material anymore due to the presence of these gaps in the system. We also saw that there was a lot of material carried down slope, meaning there are a lot of streaks of bentonite on the top surface of the um, GCL. And we actually observed accumulation of the bentonite at the bottom of the slope in some locations in this entire cell that was being exhumed. In terms of the moisture condition of the GCLs, we observed that there were places along the system where the GCL was relatively wet. We had a material which had a gel structure, relatively well hydrated material. And in some cases, we were looking at very dry conditions. This material was very similar to the incoming material. You can see the individual bentonite granules in the system. Not much moisture at all entered this system and the material was uh, looking like the new incoming product. Long-term GCL behavior overall, it's critical to maintain low hydraulic conductivity. Rigorous chemical, hydromechanical, and thermal environments can affect the hydraulic conductivity of these products. Long-term performance is a function of the GCL type. Chemistry of the hydrating or contained fluids and associated potential cation exchange, as well as degree of exposure to adverse environmental conditions with dry cycles, thermal gradients, and such. And the factors that affect long-term behavior are also closely related to moisture content of GCLs. Hydraulic conductivity can vary significantly due to the factors that affect moisture content. And overall, moisture content suction relationships can provide insight for variable saturated behavior of these materials. So I'll spend some time now going over some data and analysis that we conducted to investigate moisture suction relationships for GCL materials. This next slide shows the main constitutive behavior of suction versus moisture in a soil system. This applies to GCLs also. 
The schematic at the bottom shows the variation of suction with water content. The parameters shown in this schematic representation are associated with one of the more common formulations that are used to express moisture suction relationships in soils, the von Gunnitten formulation. And in this formulation, the psi A represents the air entry pressure in the system. This represents the suction corresponding to a moisture content where air has become essentially continuous. The air phase has become continuous in the system. Up to this point, the material is at saturation, near saturation conditions. After this point, the air phase becomes continuous within the system. The other parameters, the alpha and eta shown here are shape factors. I won't get into too much details of those here. And another significant component of the moisture suction relationships is that there is hysteresis in the system. The drying desaturation curve is different than the wetting curve or saturation curve, hydration curve. And the difference between these two curves results from mostly geometric constraints, including uh, inability to overcome some larger pores when the material is wetting as opposed to going through drying, as well as differences in contact angle between the soil surfaces and the wetting fluid along the wetting and drying paths. The differences are more pronounced at high degrees of saturation or high water contents at relatively low suction values. And the two curves actually start getting pretty close as the suction increases and moisture content decreases, reaching a single curve in the end at very high suction values. We did some experimental analysis to establish these relationships. In this case, we're looking at water content versus suction plots for a given geosynthetic clay material. This is a product that's from the US and little punch non-woven, non-woven geotextile with a granular sodium bentonite. NN1 was the designation that we used for this material. In this case, these graphics are for gravimetric water content versus suction. And the formulation that we used actually is uh, not the Fungenuton relationship, but the Fratton and Zing relationship. We've, in this paper that we analyzed this material, we also have the Fungenuton parameters also. The programmetric water content analysis, the Fratton and Zing analysis is more appropriate. In this case, we're looking at this GCL material tested when it's exposed to three different solutions, deionized water, tap water, and a 0.07 molar calcium chloride solution. This solution represents moderate to harsh leachates that we expect to encounter in landfill environments. We see that for the deionized water and tap water test, the response of the GCL is similar. We have distinctly different wetting and drying curves. The um, drying curve is up here, the wetting curve is down here. The two curves are getting closer as suction increases. When we switch to the calcium chloride solution, we notice a big difference in the response of the material. The wetting and drying curves both collapse, the moisture contents decrease, the saturated moisture contents are no longer reaching the 140 to 200% or so. We're limited to 100% and under 100%, 80 to 100% range or so. Hysteresis is not significant. And basically, everything is the same after a suction of on the order of 1,000 kPa or so. We also looked at in moisture suction relationships, effects of GCL type. This is now tests for tap water for all three cases. And in this case, we're looking at the material from the previous slide, and then one is in the middle here. It's a non-woven, non-woven, middle punched GCL. The WN2 is a woven, non-woven, again, in the middle punched GCL material. All of these materials have granular bentonite in them. And finally, the product on the right is the WNT is a Middle punched, woven, non-woven 
geotextile system, but in this case, there is an attached geofilm on the non-woven geotextile side of the material. So all three are reinforced materials and one of them contains a um, geofilm as well. What we see here for tap water response, and this applies to the DI water and CCL2 analysis also, is that the material behavior is similar. There are some minor differences in the response of the materials, but the changes are not as significant as the changes that we observed when we switched between different types of fluids that the GCL is exposed to. This last slide that's showing um, GCL moisture suction relationships now has effects of field exposure also included. This is the WN2 material. This is the material tested with deionized water, tap water over here on top, CACL2 solution, the 0 0.07 molar, CACL2 solution over here at the lower um, side of the left column. And finally, we have the same product exhumed from a field site. In this case, this product WN2 was placed in a test plot that was intended to represent cover conditions at relatively shallow depth and overlain and underlain by uh, soil materials. And this was exhumed dug up after nine years of exposure in the field. And when we look at these four graphs all together, we see that again, the deionized water and tip water response are similar. We see the significant change when we switch from these solutions to the more chemically aggressive solution, the calcium chloride solution. The water content relationships collapse again. We do not have high water contents at saturation anymore. Hysteresis is essentially non-present in the system. A similar response also occurs for the field exhumed material. This is not exposed to any chemicals. This has just been sitting in the ground for an extended period of time and has been interacting with the over and underlying soils, this GCL. In this case, again, the saturated moisture contents are much decreased. Hysteresis is decreased again significantly and water contents overall are lower than the water contents associated with testing with DI or tap water. We also looked at the bulk void ratio, which is a parameter that's similar to the regular void ratio for soils and looked at effects of hydration fluid and field exposure. This is again for this WN2 material, the metal punched woven, non-woven geotextile reinforced material. In this case, these are plots of bulk GCL void ratio versus suction. And we have data shown here for deionized water, the calcium chloride solution, as well as the field exhumed material. For the deionized water case, we see that there is a significant difference in the bulk GCL void ratio as a function of suction. We have a highly hydrated material, highly swollen material, void ratios getting up to the level of six or so under saturated conditions and decreasing void ratios with increasing suction in the system. For both the calcium chloride solution, as well as the field exhumed material, we see that there isn't much difference in the level of the void ratio as a function of suction. For the calcium chloride solution, the bulk void ratio is essentially around two with minor differences between wetting and drying paths, and even more uniform um, and singular data for the field exhumed material where we have the void ratios that are under two, somewhere between one and a half and two for the entire range of suctions that we applied in the test program. So we see that there are significant differences in the materials as a function of exposure, both to the calcium chloride solution as well as exposure to field conditions. The main reason for this is the changes in the exchangeable cations in the system. This is a graphic of mole fraction of bound cations versus hydration condition. We have the tests that we had been looking through in the earlier slides, the ionized water test, 
tap water, calcium chloride, and exhumed material. And we have one additional data set shown here. This is for a virgin material. All of these tests are associated with the WN2 GCL. And in this case, the virgin material represents the newly produced, factory produced material that has arrived uh, in the laboratory and scooped out a little bit of um, bentonite from this material and tested it without subjecting it to any kind of exposure to the eye water, tap water, or any of the solutions or any kind of field exposure. So what we have he here is for virgin material and the ion tap water exposed material, relatively similar mole fraction of the bound cations, which are dominated by the sodium in the system, which is the original product, the material that is produced in the first place, more than half of the bound cations reaching levels of 60% or so is sodium. There is some calcium in the system as well as some potassium and magnesium as well. When we look at the other two, the end two um, products here after exposure to the calcium chloride solution and the material that's exhumed from the field, we see that the bound cations have changed significantly. In this case, exposure to the calcium chloride solution, not surprisingly, resulted in calcium being the predominant cation in the exchange complex of the clay mineral. And there's a little bit of sodium left, but not as much as the starting material, the initial material. In the field, pretty much, uh, there is hardly any sodium bentonite left. And the material is changed for largely for calcium and also quite a bit for magnesium as well. So we're looking at a product in these two cases that no longer is a material that's a sodium bentonite, but it's switched to a calcium bentonite or a calcium magnesium bentonite. This has significant implications for the behavior of the material. For these two cases, we expect this material to have much thinner diffuse double layers, increased hydraulic conductivity, decreased effectiveness in terms of the um, barrier function. For all these three cases with the presence of the high amounts of sodium, we expect to see both crystalline as well as osmotic swelling in the system. Over here, we basically have only crystalline swelling, not much in osmotic swelling. And we observed this in the bulk GCL void ratio response also. We saw that for these materials, we had high bulk void ratios, a lot of swelling, a lot of hydration in the system, and not much swelling, not much change in moisture content with suction for these last two materials. We also looked at hydraulic conductivity variations and we did this with um, theoretical analysis using the relationships, the moisture suction relationships and converting those to permeability relationships using the relationships, the, um, the formulations provided by Fredlin and Zinc. This is a double Y plot where we have volumetric moisture content on one side and the coefficient of permeability on the right side on the Y axis, and we have suction on the X axis. We have two sets of data shown. The thinner lines are the drying and wetting, hydration, dehydration, um, moisture suction relationships, the kinds of relationships that we were looking at in the earlier slides, and the thicker lines correspond to permeability functions converted from the moisture suction relationships. And for both cases, drying curves are shown with the solid line, and the wetting relationships are shown with the um, dotted lines. We did this analysis for all of the materials that we tested in our program. We have now graphics of coefficient of permeability versus suction. Deionized water tests are shown on the left, tap water tests are in the middle, and calcium chloride solution tests are on the right side. For each or in each of these plots, we have data shown for drying curves for the three GCLs that we tested, as well as the wetting curves for the three GCLs that we tested. We see that the response of the DI and the tap water are relatively 
similar as was the case for the straight moisture suction relationships. The starting permeabilities are on the order of 10 to the minus 11 meters per second, which is the 10 to the minus nine centimeter per second range. And up to about the air entry suction, the coefficient of permeability is relatively similar and then starts decreasing with increasing suction beyond this point. For the calcium chloride solution, we observed that the starting coefficient of permeability is much higher. Now we have a three order of magnitude difference from 10 to the minus 11, we moved up to 10 to the minus eight. This material also has a relatively uniform um, hydraulic conductivity for a while and then starts decreasing after again, approximately the air entry suction for these products. We expect this kind of behavior in terms of higher values associated with saturated conditions and then decreasing hydraulic conductivity with increasing suction. This is the main reason why we conduct regular hydraulic conductivity tests in the laboratory under saturated conditions to arrive at the maximum permeability, maximum hydraulic conductivity and to be on the conservative side. And we see that over here. And again, there's a significant difference between the two types of curves as a function of the solution that's used in the analysis. In the next plot, I have highlighted um, results from the DI water, deionized water and calcium chloride solution tests. And we're looking at, I put the approximate moisture contents when the change in hydraulic conductivity occurred. For this case, this is somewhere in the 140 to 180% range. And over here, we have the moisture content at about 80%, after which the uh, hydraulic conductivity or coefficient of permeability starts decreasing. One caution here is uh, this analysis is applicable, this theoretical analysis is applicable to cases where the GCL microstructure remains relatively similar as the material desaturates, both for the DI water and the CACL2 solution case, which means that if there are significant changes in the structure of the material, then these relationships may not be entirely applicable. And this is actually something that we observe in the field when we are dealing with some of the highly um, dried up materials, materials with the very low moisture contents, we see that some gaps have opened. There are some macro cracks within the uh, bentonite structure. And these relationships, again, probably are not directly applicable to those cases. And if you're going to use such relationships, caution is um, something that's uh, good to remember, that's good to keep in mind. I'll finish up with a summary of um, some of our observations. GCL moisture content can vary significantly in the field. The materials are typically variably saturated in the field, generally as the degree of saturation is less than 100%. The material may be hydrating or dehydrating at a given point. There is hysteresis present between hydration and dehydration behavior, wetting and drying behavior. We expect to see a low K near saturation conditions. Cation exchange is observed due to both chemical interactions, chemical interactions, and also due to interactions with adjacent soils. And there are four states of possible moisture content saturation um, states in the field. We might have low moisture content, low degree of saturation. This may have no effect on the hydraulic conductivity. This might be material at incoming conditions, material that did not exchange with the adjacent soils or didn't interact with the overlying uh, liquids, the material is similar to the incoming virgin material. For a low water content, low degree of saturation material, we may observe significant changes. We may be catching the material during one of these cycles while, it, while it's dehydrating. It may have gone up and down between different levels of moisture and degrees of saturation, have exchanged with under or overlying soils or interacted with the contained liquids, we may see high changes in hydraulic conductivity. We may observe high moisture content, high degrees of saturation, significant effects on the hydraulic conductivity response. 
This is a material that we may be catching during hydration while the material is under wetting conditions. And by going back and forth between wetting and drying, the material have exchanged with the under or overlying soils, as well as exchange, cation exchange may have occurred with the contained liquids. We have increased hydraulic conductivity. And also the final possibility is high water content, high degree of saturation, no effects. And this is a case where the material has just vetted and stopped there, didn't have any further interactions in terms of drying out, further cycles, and it's hydrated and it's perfectly fine in terms of hydraulic conductivity. During our exhumation in the field, our data is not fully published yet. We observed all of these three conditions, and this has been reported in some cases in the literature. And in general, corresponding to these conditions, there are two states of hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic conductivity may be low in the field, over time, hydrated GCL or for a virgin like GCL material, or the hydraulic conductivity may be high for a partially hydrated GCL or GCL that underwent wet dry cycles or interactions with the contained liquids. So it's very important to understand potential exposure conditions in the field. These materials arrive at, again, very low hydraulic conductivities, but that low level of hydraulic conductivity the containment function, the barrier function may not stay in the field for extended periods of time. Finally, my last slide shows references of the work that's presented here from different sources. And in closing, I'll make a few comments um, that are more on the non-technical side of things. Jim Anson and Tara Gabichu were fellow graduate students with me at the University of Wisconsin some years ago. Craig Benson was my PhD advisor. He was also uh, Tarek's advisor. And we kept in touch with this group and over the years had opportunities to provide both research investigations and work on some professional activities as well as educational initiatives. This has been a highly rewarding experience for me, having kept in touch with my fellow graduate students, as well as instructors, advisors, and um, professors. These are starting network for people, especially for younger researchers, and it's good to keep in touch with people and look for opportunities to conduct work together. It's a great pleasure and satisfying pleasure to work with people that you um, respect and like, and provides, I think, overall positive impacts in a career, both in the long term and in the short term. So I'll stop with that and try to answer some questions that may have come during the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nazli. Um, if you can uh, stop sharing the presentation, then you should be able